Hey folks, Farmer Joe here, coming at you fresh from the field. Well, not really fresh from the field, fresh from the basement. So this is where we get our plants started. Um, and uh, today we're talking about growing great tomatoes. So one of the key, well, I mean, obviously the key with any crop is healthy transplants. That's a definite uh, important factor. So here we are middle of February, our plants are already pretty big. That's because they're being planted in the greenhouse. For your plants that you're growing at home, you wanna start it six to eight weeks ahead of time. But really, I, I would say, if this is your first time, go more with the six week time. So if you're planning on putting them in your garden on the you know 15th of May, well, start them on the 1st of April, no sooner. What you do not want uh, is a tall, leggy plant stretching out for, for, for light, root bound in its cell. You really want like a short, stout, stocky plant um, that's gonna that's gonna be able to adjust well to the transition into the field, um, and so here this is a this is what is called a fifty. So it, it's a tray that has fifty cells in it. You can grow tomatoes in fifties. Uh, they, they you know they get to be about this tall, and then you plant them out. Um, but what I do is I pot them up into four inch pots. So when these plants are gonna start uh, being about this tall, I'm gonna pot them back. I'm gonna put them into uh, a, a four inch pot that has a bit higher fertility mix. So it's gonna be a mix of uh, one third compost, two thirds potting mix. And so um, that way it's got a little bit more nutrition, it can grow and also it has more space, both for the roots and also for the, for the light. Because one of the key elements is seedlings need light. Ideally, their leaves would not be overlapping. When they're potted up into uh, pots, you would start, as they grow, you space them out more and more so that the light is penetrating, they're not shading each other. Um, and uh, that's why the timing is important because if you start it too early, they're gonna, they're gonna run out of space, both in their pot and in your lighting situation. Speaking of lights, uh, these are uh, little T5 light sticks, sun blasters, I think they're called. Um, I've got five of them per shelf and each shelf is two feet by four feet. Uh, five is a little bit overkill, like you could definitely get away with four, but uh, in my case, I, I decided to go with five. All right, let's head up to the whiteboard and we'll talk about more tomato concepts. And we're back. So growing great tomatoes, obviously, like I just mentioned, starts with great seedlings, uh, but there's a whole list of other topics that we need to consider. So we've got a variety selection, seeds and seedlings, garden prep, fertilization, trellising, pruning, pests and disease, and irrigation. And so, um, so yeah, let's just start at the top. Variety selection. So, so the basic breakdown of tomatoes is that there, there's, um, there's a spectrum from what we call determinate tomatoes to indeterminate tomatoes. So determinate tomatoes, which are also called bush tomatoes sometimes, are plants that will grow and they will, um, all their fruit will, they'll flower all at the same time and set their fruit all at the same time. So for instance, if you've got a plant growing, uh, let's say, how do we grow, how do we draw a realistic tomato plant? Uh, uh, you know, let's say you got something that looks approximately like that. So a determinate plant, what's going to happen is that your, your flowers are all going to emerge. Let's say these are flowers here. Your flowers are all going to emerge roughly at the same time and they're going to ripen roughly at the same time. So, uh, the, Bush tomatoes get to be about three feet tall. They don't, they're not the vining types. The indeterminate types is what we call vining. So they will grow very, very long and they will keep going. So for instance, a determinate tomato is going to reach a certain level and then it's determined. It's determinate. You know, it's like, that's it. That's all. It grew to three feet tall. All its fruit came on at the same time. And that's very useful, for instance, if you're canning. Using determinate varieties for canning is very useful because all the fruit um, you know, are ready roughly at the same time, which means you have a larger batch, enough tomatoes to, to, to do your canning. The difference with indeterminate tomatoes is that as they grow, the, the, the clusters will, will come on gradually. So the first flowers will come out and then your fruit will start to grow. And then the second ones will come out, they'll be a little smaller. And then the third one will be a little smaller. So you get much more of a continual, um, type of harvest from an a uh, indeterminate tomato plant. But with an indeterminate tomato plant, you really need to think about trellising because these are plants that can grow to be dozens of feet long 
uh, in, in the right conditions, or at least like six to eight feet tall uh, in a garden condition. So with an indeterminate tomato, you really have to be careful about that. Hey, Milo, watch out, you're wiggling the camera. All right, so that's a uh, variety. Okay, then other things in terms of varieties. If you wanna save your own seed, you might wanna consider growing an uh, open pollinated or heirloom variety where the seeds are gonna be true to type. So uh, compared to a hybrid. So a hybrid is a type of tomato where they take these two uh, genetic lineages and then they cross them and that cross creates hybrid vigor. So they're much more uniform, much more predictable, much, you know, much more productive. Um, but if you save those seeds from that hybrid, you're going to get a bit of parent A and a bit of parent B, which isn't always some guaranteed to be a uh, good thing. So for instance, if parent A has a very, very delicious tomato, but really a poor, uh, you know, vegetative growth structure, or maybe it's very... Uh, prone to diseases and parent B, you know, the tomatoes taste like crap, but oh my God, the plant is so vigorous and, and hearty. Well, then when they cross them, you get a very hearty plant with great tasting tomatoes. But if you save those seed, you're going to get a bit of these like weak, delicious tomatoes and a bit of these super vigorous, uh, disgusting tomatoes. So for instance, it's an example, right? Um, so if you're planning on saving the seed, you're going to want to look for open pollinated or heirlooms. If you really just, you're not planning on saving the seed, but you want like maximum production and reliability, uh, hybrids can be a good way to go. Um, so yeah, so that sort of, you know, touches on, on variety. Uh, there's so many types of tomatoes, right? There's, there's cherry tomatoes, that, like a billion type of cherry tomatoes. There's, uh, you know, what we call like a beefsteak tomato or a slice, what I call a slicer tomato, because it's not really made out of beef, right? Uh, but like a much bigger tomato. Uh, there's uh, smaller tomatoes, smaller round tomatoes. And then there's Italian tomatoes, the paste tomatoes, uh, which have less, uh, are less juicy. Uh, and so some people prefer those for sauce. Um, so variety selection, then seeds. Uh, you, know, you definitely want to be getting good quality seeds. Uh, you want to be, yeah, getting seeds from ideally from like a small or medium sized company, uh, the, the seeds that have been grown in our area, because not only is the variety going to determine what kind of tomato you get, but seeds of a variety that are grown in our climate using organic production techniques are going to be better adapted to the type of conditions that they're likely to find in your home garden. So seeds and seedlings, they brings up the question of, are you growing your own seedlings or are you buying them? Um, both have benefits uh, and, and sort of challenges to them, right? If you're gonna start your seeds, uh, your, your plants yourself from seed, that's fantastic. You need to make sure you have somewhere that's well lit. You need to have a good potting mix. Uh, and uh, the thing that I see most often with people who start their own seedlings is overwatering. So please don't water them too much. They need to dry in between waterings. Like the surface, well, Hold on, hold on. When the seeds are just tiny, tiny, and they haven't come out yet, yes, you need to keep it evenly moist, but not soaked, right? That, that they, don't, they need to not dry out at that stage. But once the plant has come out and is starting to grow, you need to make sure that you're letting the soil dry in between waterings. What this does is that it kills any, like, um, it, it reduces the risk of having a sort of like algae slime that grows on the top of your seedlings uh, and blocks, you know, sort of blocks the oxygen and the, the, the water transfer. That's also where uh, fruit flies, those little black flies come from. They're actually laying their eggs in that algae. So it's really important that you're allowing your plant to dry in between each watering. And then I'd say about once a week, you want to flush it. So what that means is that once a week, you want to water it a, a little bit too much and you want to see water dripping out the bottom of your plant. So that's once a week, you want to see water dripping out. Then in between each watering, you want to make sure that the surface of the soil is drying out. Uh, and you want to make sure you're using good quality water. So uh, especially on the east side of Ottawa, if you're using well water, it's possibly too salty. So if you're having some problems with your seedlings, send a sample to the lab and you can figure out uh, if you have too much salt in your water or not. So then garden prep. So tomatoes love sun. They need full sun, good sun. They need a, a rich, uh, well-drained soil. This means it's a soil where the, it's not staying waterlogged all summer long, uh, and where after a rain, the water flows freely. 
you want to guard. You want the roots to be able to penetrate deeply. So you want to use a, a fork, a garden fork, to fork your soil. You don't want to be flipping over the soil. You don't. No need. Just sticking the garden fork in, pulling it back till you see the soil crack. That's perfect. Um, fertilization. Uh, tomatoes are what we would call a heavy feeder, so they have a high demand in nutrients. That being said, I've been working with the local horticultural society and looking at some soil analysis. And it turns out that most home gardeners, like the, the level of fertility in your soil is just like crazy through the roof. So you probably don't need as much fertilizer as you think you do. Um, that being said, there's no way to know unless you do a soil analysis and, uh, you know, come to one of our workshops and figure out how, you know, and learn how to interpret soil analysis. We can teach you that. Um, but there's really no, no, no way to know what, how to fertilize them unless you've analyzed your soil and you understand what that means. Um, one of the things with, with tomatoes is that uh, it can be nice to, 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 to split the fertility into two separate doses. So maybe like two thirds at the beginning. And then once the first fruit starts to set, then you can add the second, you know, second batch one third later. Um, and tomatoes generally uh, need a lot of potassium and magnesium. And so just make sure that you're using a fertilizer. Like I think the uh, ActiSol, the chicken manure, they, they, they have a version that's like, I think four, six, eight, that would be a good one. Um, anyway, uh, so really get your soil tested or uh, just know that most home gardens are already very rich. So it's a bit of a question mark what you actually need to put or not. Uh, the next question is pruning and trellising. So this is important. So if you don't do anything, your tomatoes is, are gonna just invade. They're just gonna spread, they're gonna be sprawling, the fruit are gonna be on the ground. Um, and, and what's gonna happen is that because everything's just like that you're gonna get reduced airflow and that's ideal for fungal diseases and bacterial diseases. Uh, they're gonna affect the plant. So you, the point of trellising is to have, uh, to keep the fruit off the ground and to create a structure where you have good airflow. Because what happens is when the leaves are damp and humid, that's when the, the spores of the different types of fungi can germinate or the bacteria can thrive and you get diseases in your, in your tomatoes. Um, so trellising is really important. Uh, there's those trellising cages, which are good. Uh, personally, what we do is we put like a, 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 a stake every five feet. We, we drive it into the ground uh, and then we have our tomatoes plants in between, let's say three tomato plants in between each one. And as the tomato plants go, we're adding strings up like this. But of course, if uh, at the end you need some sort of string bracing down diagonal because you don't want to, you don't want your, you know, your tomato plants are going to get pretty heavy. So you don't want uh, that to get pulled in that direction. So you do want something just bracing it down, but that's how we do it. It's called the basket weave technique. And, uh, you can also uh, have a trellising technique where if you, you know, if you're handy, uh, what you can do is, you know, you could, for example, have like a, like a four by four going into the ground with a, with a two by four or something across the top in a T shape. Up, and then you'd have your tomato plant and you'd have, up, you'd have a, a, a wire going down that the tomato would be growing up like this and like this. That's another option. Um, but like I say, those, those trellising baskets can work great. Uh, or you can literally just have a single stake for each tomato. That's possible too. But I really like the, the rebar uh, and, and twine method that I was showing there. So you have your, you have your soil, you have your plants, and every three uh, you, plants you drive in a rebar. You want to make sure that that's going in, you know, maybe a foot and a half, two feet in the ground, depending on your soil. And then you have at least... You know, I figure at least up to your belly button or like chest height in terms of, 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 of height. So I use, for instance, uh, we use like a five or six foot uh, piece. In our sandy soil, we tend to use six foot so that we can drive it in further. Uh, so a six foot rebar. Uh, and then as the plants grow, we're just using baler twine to tie them up as they grow. Um, so that's uh, trellising. Now pruning, pruning is important because... Um, sort of for the same reasons I just mentioned in terms of disease control. So when you're pruning your plant, you're creating a more open uh, growth habit, which allows better air circulation. So what happens with a tomato plant is 
Let's see how good my art skills are. But let's say this is the main stem, and then you have a leaf coming off. You have a leaf, you have a leaf. At the base of the leaf right here, you're gonna have a second stem, or you're gonna have a lateral stem growing out. So right here, what you're gonna see is you're gonna see another stem start to grow out from the base of, this, of, of the leaf. At that node, at the intersection between the leaf and the main stem, there's another stem. We call those suckers. And so it's important to just get those off. Um, basically, using your fingers is the best method. Uh, you can also use a little pair, a little like fine scissors, uh, but it's really recommended to use your, your scissors, uh, your fingers, sorry, and just snip, snip, just, just sort of do a back and forth motion. What, you really want to make sure that you're getting it all. You do not want to leave a little stump. Because if you leave a little stump after you break it off, um, what's going to happen is that that stump is going to serve as an entry point for diseases into your plant. So you really, really want to make sure that you're getting it all the way down. And maybe Amanda, uh, maybe we can dig up a, an old, I think I have a video, so we'll see if we can't dig up and real, repost a video about pruning. But it's really critical to get that, those suckers off all the way down, not leaving a stump. Um, that being said, so when your plant starts to grow, uh, it's going to start to grow, and you're going to have some leaves, and you're take those suckers off, but when you have the first flower cluster, the first little flowers, what you'll notice is that the sucker underneath the first flower cluster is very strong and vigorous. It's recommended that you leave that, and you make that will turn into a second head. So what you're gonna end up with is a two-headed plant where you're taking off the suckers except that you're leaving the sucker below the first flower cluster. So you're leaving the sucker underneath the first flower cluster. All other suckers are being removed. And then you continue to prune both these heads as if they were tomato plants. So you would take this, you would take the suckers off here, take the suckers off there, et cetera, et cetera. And just to be clear, you're not taking the leaf off you're taking the sucker off. So at the junction between the leaf and the stem, you have a sucker. Let's say the pen is the sucker. You're just taking that off. You're leaving the leaf and the main stem. And you want to be taking those suckers off when they're about three to four inches long. That's a good, like a nice size for breaking them off. It's also easy to identify because sometimes up in the head of the plant, it's not really clear what's a sucker and what's your main growing tip. And you definitely don't want to cut your head off of your tomatoes plant because they won't keep growing. Um, so I would say for beginners, don't try to prune all the way in the head. Wait till the sucker is about three or four inches off and boop, just snip it right off. So that's pruning. And so pruning, this is how you prune an indeterminate tomato. This is how you prune what you would call a vining tomato. For a bush tomato that we also call determinate, what you do is you prune off the suckers until the fat, the fat sucker. The fat sucker is always the one that's right under the first flower cluster. And then you would just leave all the suckers from there. And that's really how you get a bush tomato plant um, to, to, to have its maximal yield. Is for, for a determinate tomato, which is also known as bush, you're pruning the suckers until the first flower cluster, and then you're leaving everything else after that. So I hope that's clear. Um, if not, I invite you to come by the farm this summer and I can show you. Uh, probably we'll do a little workshop. Um, so that's pruning. Pests and disease. Uh, in terms of pests, like there's not many insect pests that affect tomatoes. Uh, there are a couple. There's the tomato, tobacco hornworm, which is this like giant caterpillar, which is really gross. Uh, which you just sort of have to pick off and put into a bucket of soapy water to drown it. Um, but generally speaking, tomatoes don't have many insects that affect them. Uh, the main pest of tomatoes is squirrels. Now, I don't have squirrels because we're out in the field and we have a lot of natural predators, but I know that home gardeners have a lot of problems with squirrels and other mammals uh, coming and stealing the tomatoes and nibbling them and all that. And as far as I can tell, the only way to take care of that is to create a closed in space, to create a raised bed or uh, with a netting over top of it. Because I've heard all sorts of stuff about, you know, eggshells and hot peppers and cat piss and this and that and that, you know, 
There's all sorts of nice ideas out there, but as far as I can tell, the only thing that really works is to block them out. You gotta build a cage to keep the squirrels out. What I would recommend is if you have your raised bed, something like that, I mean, to me, you know, you'd either frame it in, you know, with two by fours or two by threes with chicken wires, or you could, you know, have a spike here and use like electrical conduit pipe to make a sort of an arch type thing and cover that in chicken wire. But one way or another, I believe that to prevent the squirrels, you have to create something that's going to block them and you'll physically keep them away. Um, that's all. I know, I know it's a pain, but that's all I can figure out. Um, in terms of diseases, so tomatoes do have a lot of diseases that can affect them. Um, so not a lot of insects, but a lot of diseases, mostly fungus and, and bacteria. So there's a whole range. I won't discuss them each individually. Um, what to say? I mean, the, the main thing is that you need to create dry conditions, right? Because tomatoes are... are Originally, they're from the Andes, right? They're a high altitude, dry climate crop, right? And so, um, so, so, so they don't tolerate the humidity that we have here in, in Eastern Canada. And so that's why with the humidity, the leaves stay moist and that's when the spores of the different fungus and all that can sprout and, uh, you know, and start to be an issue. So uh, in terms of what you can do, number one is Pruning and trellising. So making sure that your plants aren't all sprawled out, making sure that there's good airflow, making sure you have the right spacing, that you have at least two feet in between plants. That will definitely help as well. Um, the other thing you can do if, you're, if you want is, uh, well, well, what we do, I'll tell you what we do. We don't grow tomatoes in the field anymore uh, because of this because of the diseases. So what we do is we build these simple tunnels over them. So they're just metal pipe with a single layer of, of, of transparent plastic over it. I mean, this could be built, like you could get those materials at a hardware store uh, and put up a little tunnel in your backyard. That would be amazing. And so what that does is that it creates a microclimate where it doesn't rain directly on the plants. So when you keep those leaves dry, you, you, you interrupt that cycle of those spores sprouting and creating fungal diseases. Um, the other thing that's sort of tangentially connected to that is how do you water? You never want to be getting water on the leaves of your tomato. You're always going to be bottom watering, right? You want to be using a soaker hose or drip tape to make sure that you're, you're irrigating in a way that doesn't splash uh, soil and water onto, onto the leaves. Other than that, I mean, there's also, uh, you can be using like compost teas and, and, and that kind of thing as a prevention. Uh, you can be also using copper sulfate or other copper-based sprays uh, as an organically approved fungicide. Uh, we don't do that because we have them in the tunnels and we don't have to, uh, but that is, a, that is an avenue. Uh, I think it's called copper spray is the product uh, that's allowed in organic, but you'd have, you'd have to look that up. Um, and I believe those would be available at Richie's. Um, but really, uh, pruning, trellising, bottom watering, that is the foundation of disease control. Uh, and, you know, at a certain point, seeing, like, are you getting, um, you know, oh, right, I forgot about that. So the other thing that we do is leaf removal. So once we have a big tomato plant, right, we've got our, our tomato plant growing on two stems because we left the sucker that's growing right under the first flower cluster. So this is the first flower cluster. That's our first, first cluster of fruit. We left the sucker underneath. So now we have a second tomato plant growing on the same plant. And so um, about, you know, once, uh, once those fruit there are the size of golf balls, we take off all the leaves up until that junction. So, so not only did we remove the suckers, but now we're going back later and we're removing the leaves up until that junction. And so what that does is that allows the airflow to, to circulate around the base of the plants and help to keep those uh, conditions dry. All right, I know this is a long video. Last thing I wanna talk about is irrigation. Irrigation is critical. Uh, 
one of the things that you may have seen and thought that it was a disease, but it's actually not a disease, it's called blossom and rot. So it's when you have a nice tomato, but when you look underneath, it's all it's got a big black circle. It's all the bottom of the tomato is all black and a little bit gross. And so that's actually not a disease. That's actually caused uh, by a calcium deficiency. And calcium is not very mobile. And so uh, you have plenty of calcium in your soil. You don't need to add calcium. The problem is when there's uneven irrigation, when the soil is too wet, too dry, too wet, too dry, that's when uh, they, you can get a calcium deficiency, even if you have plenty of calcium in your soil. And so it's really important that you're irrigating uh, in, a, in a sort of even manner. Uh, I, would re I would recommend getting a little irrigation timer. And personally, I mean, we, we, uh, we set it to irrigate several times a day based on a timer. Depends on your soil, depends on how much light there is. But roughly speaking, uh, if you had uh, some drip tape, you could be irrigating, let's say, three times 15 minutes per day. Uh, that would be great, you know, maybe at like at nine, at 12, and at two, right? So that you're, you're, you don't want to irrigate too late in the day because you do want to allow your soil to dry overnight so that by the next morning, it's a little bit dry. Uh, but yeah, you could have three irrigations per day, nine, noon, and two, 15 minutes each. That could be a good starting point uh, in terms of irrigation. Uh, but really, you need to be looking. You need to be feeling, does my soil feel dry? Does it feel wet? Does it feel, when I squeeze it, right? When you squeeze your soil, is it like dripping water out of it? That would be too wet. Or when you squeeze it, do we just get one or two little drops coming out? That's perfect, that's perfect. So uh, irrigation is super important to keep it nice and steady. Uh, and so yeah, that's what goes into growing great tomatoes. And uh, it's fun, it's an adventure. And if all this seems like a lot of information, you know what the magic is? Tomatoes grow by themselves. You don't even have to do anything. Each little seed contains all the information needed to produce an abundant harvest of tomatoes. And so this is all like, like sort of like advanced ideas and techniques that can help you really optimize your tomato production. But if this seems like a lot of information, please just start with a tomato plant and, uh, and, uh, and, and give it a go. Oh, one last thing, fertilization. If you're growing in a container, if you're growing in a bucket, you really wanna, I had mentioned splitting the fertilization to two doses, but if you're growing in a pot, you wanna be fertilizing every two weeks with small amounts of fertilizer. Um, so for instance, in a five gallon bucket, you might be doing like two tablespoons of the chicken manure pellets every two weeks. That's just an approximation. I, I, I would have to sort of just confirm that amount. Uh, but roughly speaking, depending on what kind of soil you're using and all that, you'd be fertilizing every two weeks with some chicken manure. That could be a great option. Um, but definitely if you're in a bucket, do not put it all on at once because what's going to happen is that you're going to have too much salinity in your, bu in your bucket, basically. Um, and then, then, then that's going to interfere with the absorption of nutrients uh, in the tomato plant, ironically. Too much fertilizer is like not enough sometimes. So really, if you're growing in a container, I would encourage you to really split that out, fertilizing every two weeks. The other thing I want to mention is um, pruning. Uh, well, one thing that we do is six to eight weeks before the frost. So let's say that we expect to get a frost, let's say mid-October. So that would be that, that, sort of like early to mid-August. You want to chop the heads off your tomato. So check. You just pinch those heads right off. Um, and what that's going to do is it's going to uh, basically change how energy is being allocated in the plant. So by the middle of August, you, what you want is you want the plant to focus on making ripe fruit. Your, your plant is probably already full of green fruit that are not going to have time to ripen before the frost unless you do this. So six to eight weeks before the frost. You're pinching the heads off and that forces the plant to go from a mentality of vegetative growth into like, oh shit, I don't have a head anymore. Let me ripen all my fruit. And so that's a great technique to really optimize your yield so that you don't end up in September or October with a whole bunch of green fruit that is basically, you know, wasted potential. So this is really a, a next level technique, pinching off the heads six to eight weeks uh, before. Um, and when you do pinch it, pinch it right above a leaf. You don't, you never want a little stump. You really, so let's say your, your plant is growing like this and you got leaf, 
leaf. You know, you really want to, you do, what you do not want to do, you don't want to pinch it here and have a stump on it. You're, you want to pinch it right above a leaf. And that way your plant will just be ending with a nice leaf. You won't have any little stump to act as, a, as an entry port for a disease. And your tomato will now focus on ripening the fruit. All right, well, that was it. Have fun. And uh, if you have any questions, come on by the farm store this, question, this summer. I always like chatting. And uh, I'll catch you on the flip side.